Fascism in Africa refers to the phenomenon of fascist parties and movements that were active in Africa. South Africa South Africa's status as an independent country dominated by the white minority meant that it shared a number of characteristics with Europe whilst also having an institutionalized form of racism in the apartheid system. As such it proved a fertile ground for the development of groups inspired by European fascism. Nazism found an audience in the country, with pro-Nazi elements organized by Louis Weichart in 1932 under the name South African Gentile National Socialist Movement, a group that soon became known as the Greyshirts. Although the group enjoyed some support and continued after the Second World War they never became sufficiently important for the government to take action against them. The other main fascist group was the Oswebrandwag founded in 1939, a group also inspired by Adolf Hitler. The two differed however as the Greyshirts emphasized Aryan race rhetoric and so organized amongst the various white immigrant communities whilst the OB were specifically for Afrikaner only. A third, more minor group, the New Order, emerged in 1940 under the leadership of former cabinet minister Oswald Perot. After the Second World War Perot became an important figure in neo-fascism, working closely with Oswald Mosley, Nation Europa and AFX Baron. Nazi Germany sought to encourage such activity with former Olympic boxer Roby Liebrandt active as an agent for the Abwehr during the war. The Nazi Party itself also organized until it was outlawed in 1936. In the post war era, far right groups that are sometimes characterized as being neo fascist in nature include the Afrikaner Weerstandsbeweging, the Vereniging van Orgewerkers, the Herstigte Nationale Party, and the Bormag, as well as elements within the coalition Afrikaner Volksfront. North Africa North Africa has also seen activity that has sometimes been identified as fascism. The high level of movement between France and French North Africa meant that political ideas travelled between the regions and as early as the 1890s the proto-fascist anti-Semitic League of France was active in Algiers. It was not until later however that indigenous versions began to emerge. In 1930s Egypt the Young Egypt movement, known as the Greenshirts, became important. They followed the models of fascist groups in Europe and praised Italian fascism and Nazism, although they largely supported existing elites. Within the Egyptian army general Aziz Ali al-Misri was noted for his fascist sympathies, to the extent that he was dismissed as chief of staff in 1940. Masri deserted the army and attempted to link up with the Africa Corps but was arrested before he could escape. In Italian Libya, Benito Mussolini sought to gain popularity by presenting himself as a defender of Islam and he formed a Libyan Arab fascist party to which indigenous people were admitted. This was not the case in Ethiopia, where resistance was much fiercer and fascism did not take root. In both colonies, though, fascist youth movements were formed under Italian tutelage Arab Lichter Youth and Ethiopian Lichter Youth. East Africa Like North Africa, the east of the continent saw some early development amongst white immigrant communities. A number of pro-fascist aristocrats, including Jocelyn Hay, 22nd Earl of Errol and Gerard Wallop, 9th Earl of Portsmouth, made their homes in Kenya during the 1930s. Although too few in number to form any meaningful political grouping they nonetheless maintained close links to the British Union of Fascists, of which most had been members. Other white settlers organized pro-Nazi groups in Rhodesia during the Second World War. The Coalition for the Defense of the Republic CDR, has been described as a Rwandan Hutu fascist political party responsible for inciting the Rwandan genocide. The CDR refused to operate within the law nor cooperate with other Rwandan political parties. The CDR had a paramilitary wing, the Mapuza Mugambi that repeatedly provoked violent confrontations with members of other parties, using hand grenades and bombs, and served as one of the death squads that massacred Tutsis in the Rwandan genocide. Parallels have frequently been drawn between Hitler and Uganda's IDI Amin and it has been claimed that Amin's admiration for Hitler was so great that he even intended to build a statue of him. 
American political scientist and historian Robert Paxton, a scholar on fascism, has stated, that from an ideological standpoint he shared little or nothing with proper fascism, sharing only cruelty and antisemitism with Hitler. However, Swiss historian Max Linager Gomez, a scholar on African history, has identified Idi Amin amongst a list of other African leaders as been an example of the phenomenon of Afro-fascism. American historian and political scientist Robert Paxton, a scholar on the topic of fascism, has rejected the idea that there have been indigenous fascist movements in Africa, claiming that there have been no prominent examples of fascist regimes amongst Third World dictatorship. Paxton also rejects the view that Idi Amin's rule in Uganda was fascist in nature. However, other scholars assert that there have been indigenous fascist regimes in Africa. Swiss historian Max Linager Gomez, a scholar on African history, has identified multiple African regimes as being examples of the phenomenon of Afro-fascism, including, Francisco Macias Nguema's regime in Equatorial Guinea, Mobutu Sese Siko's regime in Zaire, Idi Amin's in Uganda, Nasingbe Ayadema in Togo, and Mengistu Haile Mariam's regime in Ethiopia. The Coalition for the Defense of the Republic has been regarded as a Rwandan Hutu fascist political party responsible for inciting the Rwandan genocide. Such post-war regimes are excluded from political science topologies of fascism however. Such notions of indigenous African fascism have generally been excluded, often explicitly, from political science topologies of fascism. As well as Paxton Roger Griffin rejects the notion of fascism in Africa outside of South Africa in his book The Nature of Fascism, arguing that African dictatorship do not seek the mass mobilization of their populations necessary for a regime to be called fascist, whilst with national borders often arbitrarily set by colonial powers and tribal, religious and ethnic loyalties frequently much stronger than national identity unifying nationalist palingenetic myths could not be constructed by groups, another precondition for true fascism. For Griffin a precondition for the rise of fascism is a breakdown in traditional society combined with an increasing liberalization against the backdrop of socio-political instability, which also rules out post-colonial Africa where such liberalization did not take place until much more recently, with post-colonial regimes frequently transferring directly to dictatorship, whether actual or effective. Paul Hayes accepts that individual African countries may demonstrate some characteristics of fascism, notably aspects of the regimes of Hastings' band in Malawi or Abiyad Karum in Zanzibar, but argues that in no state are enough present simultaneously that anywhere in Africa could truly be labeled fascist from an academic basis. Similarly Stanley G. Payne contends that whilst a one-party nationalist dictatorship may have been taken as the model in some African states none of these can genuinely be defined as fascist because the single parties usually have a small membership and often do not exist at any more than a basic functional level. The political economies do not follow the corporatist or national syndicalist models that define fascism and there is no philosophical or political culture of fascism, with such African regimes being highly pragmatic and even non-ideological in nature. Indeed, the notion of true fascism, as opposed to mere dictatorship, in Africa was further eroded in the 1970s when many regimes did add an ideological dimension in the shape of Marxism-Leninism. See also Tropical fascism Fascism in Asia Fascism in Europe Fascism in North America Fascism in South America